Section two of My First Summer in the Sierra. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. My First Summer in the Sierra by John Muir. Read by Adrian Pretzelis. Section two. June seven. The sheep were sick last night and many of them are still far from well, hardly able to leave camp, coughing, groaning, looking wretched and pitiful, all from eating the leaves of the blessed azalea, so at least say the shepherd and the don. Having had but little grass since they left the plains, they are starving, and so eat anything green they can get. Sheepmen call the azalea sheep poison and wonder what the Creator was thinking about when He made it. So desperately does sheep business blind and degrade, though supposed to have a refining influence in the good old days we read of. The California sheep owner is in haste to get rich, and often does, now that pasturage costs nothing, while the climate is so favourable that no winter food supply, shelter pens, or barns are required. Therefore large flocks may be kept at slight expense, and large profits realized, the money invested doubling, it is claimed, every other year. This quickly acquired wealth usually creates desire for more. Then indeed the wool is drawn close down over the poor fellow's eyes, dimming or shutting out almost everything worth seeing. As for the shepherd, his case is worse still especially in winter when he lives alone in a cabin. For although stimulated at times by hopes of one day owning a flock and getting rich like his boss, he at the same time is likely to be degraded by the life he leads, and seldom reaches the dignity or advantage or disadvantage of ownership. The degradation in his case has for cause one not far to seek. He is solitary most of the year and solitude to most people seems hard to bear. He seldom has much good mental work or recreation in the way of books. Coming into his dingy hovel cabin at night, stupidly weary, he finds nothing to balance and level his life with the universe. No, after his dull drag all day after the sheep, he must get his supper. He is likely to slight this task and try to satisfy his hunger with whatever comes handy. Perhaps no bread is baked. Then he just makes a few grimy flapjacks in his unwashed frying-pan, boils a handful of tea, and perhaps fries a few strips of rusty bacon. Usually there are dried peaches or apples in the cabin, but he hates to be bothered with the cooking of them, just swallows the bacon and flapjacks and depends on the genial stupefaction of tobacco for the rest. Then to bed, often without removing the clothing worn during the day. Of course his health suffers, reacting on his mind, and seeing nobody for weeks or months, he finally becomes semi-insane, or wholly so. The shepherd in Scotland seldom thinks of being anything but a shepherd. He is probably descended from a race of shepherds, and inherited a love and aptitude for the business almost as marked as that of his collie. He has but a small flock to look after, sees his family and neighbours, has time for reading in fine weather, and often carries books to the fields with which he may converse with kings. The Oriental shepherd, we read, called his sheep by name. They knew his voice and followed him. The flocks must have been small and easily managed allowing piping on the hills an ample leisure for reading and thinking. But whatever the pleasures of sheep culture in other times and countries, the California shepherd, as far as I've seen or heard, is never quite sane for any considerable time. Of all nature's voices, ba is about all he hears. Even the howls and caes of coyotes might be a blessing if well heard but he hears them only through a blur of mutton and wool, and they do him no good. The sick sheep are getting well, and the shepherd is discoursing on the various poisons lurking in these high pastures. 
azalea, calmia, alkali. After crossing the north fork of the Merced, we turned to the left toward Pilot Peak, and made a considerable ascent on a rocky, brush-covered ridge to Brown's Flat, where, for the first time since leaving the plains, the flock is enjoying plenty of green grass. Mr. Delaney intends to seek a permanent camp somewhere in the neighbourhood, to last several weeks. Before noon we passed a Bower Cave, a delightful marble palace, not dark and dripping, but filled with sunshine which pours into it through its wide-open mouth facing the south. It has a fine, deep, clear little lake with mossy banks, embowered with broad-leaved maples all underground, wholly unlike anything I have seen in the cave line, even in Kentucky, where a large part of the state is honeycombed with caves. This curious specimen of subterranean scenery is located on a belt of marble that is said to extend from the north end of the range to the extreme south. Many other caves occur on the belt, but none like this, as far as I have learned, combining as it does sunny outdoor brightness and vegetation with the crystalline beauty of the underworld. It is claimed by a Frenchman, who has fenced and locked it, placed a boat on the lakelet, and seats on the mossy bank under the maple trees, and charges a dollar admission fee. Being on one of the ways to the Yosemite Valley, a good many tourists visit it during the travel months of summer, regarding it as an interesting addition to their Yosemite wonders. Poison oak, or poison ivy, Rubus diversiloba, both as a bush and a scrambler up trees and rocks, is common throughout the foothills region, up to a height of at least three thousand feet above the sea. It is somewhat troublesome to most travellers, inflaming the skin and eyes, but blending harmoniously with its companion plants, and many a charming flower leans confidently upon it for protection and shade. I have oftentimes found the curious twining lily, Strophilarian californicum, climbing its branches, showing no fear, but rather congenial companionship. Sheep eat it without apparent ill effects, so do horses to some extent, though not fond of it, and to many persons it is harmless. Like most other things not apparently useful to man, it has few friends, and the blind question, why was it made, goes on and on with never a guess that, first of all, it might have been made for itself. Brown's Flat is a shallow, fertile valley on the top of the divide between the North Fork of the Merced and Bull Creek, commanding magnificent views in every direction. Here the adventurous pioneer David Brown made his headquarters for many years, dividing his time between gold-hunting and bear-hunting. Where could lonely hunter find a better solitude? Game in the woods, gold in the rocks, health and exhilaration in the air while the colours and cloud furniture of the sky are ever inspiring through all sorts of weather. Though sternly practical, like most pioneers, old David seems to have been uncommonly fond of scenery. Mr. Delaney, who knew him well, tells me that he dearly loved to climb to the summit of a commanding ridge, to gaze abroad over the forests, to the snow-clad peaks and sources of the rivers and over the foreground valleys and gulches to note where miners were at work, or claims were abandoned, judging by smoke from cabins and campfires, the sound of axes, etc., and when a rifle shot was heard, to guess who was the hunter, whether Indian or some poacher, on his wide domain. His dog Sandy accompanied him everywhere, and well the little hairy mountaineer knew and loved his master and his master's aims. In deer-hunting he had but little to do, trotting behind his master as he slowly made his way through the wood, careful not to step heavily on dry twigs, scanning open spots in the chaparral where the game loves to feed in the early morning and towards sunset, peering cautiously over ridges as new outlets were reached, and along the meadowy borders of streams. But when bears were hunted, little Sandy became more important and it was as a bear-hunter that Brown became famous. His hunting method, as described by Mr. Delaney, who had passed many a night with him in his lonely cabin, and learned his stories, 
was simply to go slowly and silently through the best bear pastures with his dog and rifle and a few pounds of flour until he found a fresh track, and then to follow it to the death, paying no heed to the time required. Wherever the bear went, he followed, led by little Sandy, who had a keen nose and never lost the track, however rocky the ground. When high open points were reached, the likeliest places were carefully scanned. The time of year enabled the hunter to determine approximately where the bear would be found. In the spring and early summer, on open spots about the banks of streams and stringy places, eating grass and clover and lupins, or in dry meadows, feasting on strawberries. Towards the end of the summer, on dry ridges, feasting on manzanita berries, sitting on his haunches, pulling down the laden branches with his paws, and pressing them together so as to get good compact mouthfuls, however much mixed with twigs and leaves. In the Indian summer, beneath the pines, chewing the cones cut off by the squirrels, or occasionally climbing a tree to gnaw and break off the fruitful branches. In late autumn, when acorns are ripe, Bruin's favourite feeding grounds are groves of the California oak in park-like canyon flats. Always the cunning hunter knew where to look, and seldom came upon Bruin unawares. When the hot scent showed the dangerous game was nigh, a long halt was made, and the intricacies of the topography and vegetation leisurely scanned to catch a glimpse of the shaggy wanderer, or to at least determine where he was most likely to be. Whenever, said the hunter, I saw a bear before it saw me, I had no trouble in killing it. I just studied the lay of the land and got to leeward of it, no matter how far around I had to go, and then worked up to within a few hundred yards or so, at the foot of a tree that I could easily climb, but too small for the bear to climb. Then I looked well to the condition of my rifle, took off my boot so as to climb well if necessary, and waited till the bear turned its side in clear view, when I could make a sure, or at least a good shot. In case it showed fright, I climbed out of reach. But bears are slow and awkward with their eyes, and being to leeward of them, they could not scent me, and I often got in a second shot before they noticed the smoke. Usually, however, they run when wounded and hide in the brush. I let them run a good safe time before I ventured to follow them, and Sandy was pretty sure to find them dead. If not, he barked and drew their attention, and occasionally rushed in for a distracting bite, so that I was able to get to a safe distance for a final shot. Oh, yes, bear hunting is safe enough when followed in a safe way, though like every other business it has its accidents, and little Doggy and I have had some close calls. Bears like to keep out of the way of men as a general thing, but if an old, lean, hungry mother with cubs met a man on her own ground, she would, in my opinion, try to catch and eat him. This would be only fair play, anyhow, for we eat them. But nobody hereabout has been used for bear grub that I know of." Brown had left his mountain home ere we arrived, but a considerable number of digger Indians still linger in their cedar-bark huts on the edge of the flat. They were attracted in the first place by the white hunter, whom they had learned to respect, and to whom they looked for guidance and protection against their enemies, the Paiutes, who sometimes made raids across from the east side of the range to plunder the stores of the comparatively feeble diggers and steal their wives. June 8. The sheep, now grassy and good-natured, slowly nibbled their way down into the valley of the North Fork of the Merced, at the foot of Pilot Peak Ridge, to the place selected by the Don for our first central camp, a picturesque, hopper-shaped hollow formed by converging hill slopes at the bend of the river. Here racks for dishes and provisions were made in the shade of the river-bank trees, and beds of fern-fronds, cedar plumes, and various flowers, each to the taste of its owner, and a corral back on the open flat for the wool. June 9 How deep our sleep last night in the mountain's heart, beneath the trees and stars, hushed by solemn-sounding waterfalls 
and many small soothing voices in sweet accord whispering peace. And our first pure mountain day, warm, calm, cloudless, how immeasurable it seems, how serenely wild! I can scarcely remember its beginning. Along the river, over the hills, in the ground, in the sky, spring-work is going on with joyful enthusiasm. New life, new beauty, unfolding, unrolling in glorious exuberant extravagance. New birds in their nests, new winged creatures in the air, and new leaves, new flowers, spreading, shining, rejoicing everywhere. The trees about the camp stand close, giving ample shade for ferns and lilies, while back from the bank most of the sunshine reaches the ground, calling up the grasses and flowers in glorious array. Tall bromus, waving like bamboos, starry compositae, monadella, mariposa tulips, lupins, gilias, violets, glad children of light. Soon every fern frond will be unrolled, great beds of common pateris and woodwardia along the river, wreaths and rosettes of pelia and chilanthes on sunny rocks. Some of the woodwardia fronds are already six feet high. A handsome little shrub, Chamabatia foliosa, belonging to the rose family, spreads a yellow-green mantle beneath the sugar-pines for miles without a break not mixed or roughened with other plants. Only here and there a Washington lily may be seen nodding above its even surface, or a bunch or two of tall bromus, as if for ornament. This fine carpet shrub begins to appear at, say, twenty-five hundred or three thousand feet above sea level, is about knee-high or less, has brown branches, and the largest stems are only about half an inch in diameter. The leaves, light yellow-green, thrice pinnate and finely cut, give them a rich ferny appearance, and they are dotted with minute glands that secrete wax with a peculiar pleasant odour that blends finely with the spicy fragrance of the pines. The flowers are white, five-eighths of an inch in diameter, and look like those of the strawberry. I am delighted with this little bush. It is the only true carpet shrub of this part of the Sierra. The manzanita, ramnus, and most of the species of ceanothus make shaggy rugs and border fringes, rather than carpets or mantles. The sheep do not take kindly to their new pastures, perhaps from being too closely hemmed in by the hills. They are never fully at rest. Last night they were frightened, probably by bears or coyotes prowling and planning for a share of the grand mass of mutton. June 10. Very warm. We get water for the camp from a rock basin at the foot of a picturesque cascading reach of the river, where it is well stirred and made lively without being beaten into dusty foam. The rock here is a black metamorphic slate, worn to smooth knobs in the stream channels contrasting with the fine grey and white cascading water as it glides and glances and falls in lace-like sheets and braided over folding currents. Tufts of sedge growing on the rock knobs that rise above the surface produce a charming effect, the long elastic leaves arching over in every direction, the tips of the longest drooping into the current, which, dividing against the projecting rocks, make still finer lines uniting with the sedges to see how beautiful the happy stream can be made. Nor is this all, for the giant saxifrage also is growing on some of the knob-rock islets, firmly anchored and displaying their broad, round, umbrella-like leaves in showy groups by themselves or above the sedge-tufts. The flowers of this species, saxifraga peltata, are purple and form tall, glandular racemes that are in bloom before the appearance of the leaves. The fleshy rootstocks grip the rock in cracks and hollows, and thus enable the plant to hold on against occasional floods—a marked species employed by nature 
to make yet more beautiful the most interesting portions of these cool, clear streams. Near camp the trees arch over from bank to bank, making a leafy tunnel full of soft, subdued light through which the young river sings and shines like a happy, living creature. Heard a few peals of thunder from the upper Sierra, and saw firm white bossy cumuli rising back of the pines. This was about noon. June 11. On one of the eastern branches of the river discovered some charming cascades, with a pool at the foot of each of them. White dashing water, a few bushes and tufts of carex on ledges, leaning over with fine effect, and large orange lilies assembled in superb groups on fertile soil-beds beside the pools. There are no large meadows or grassy plains near camp to supply lasting pasture for our thousands of busy nibblers. The main dependence is on Ceanothus brush on the hills, and tufted grass-patches here and there, with lupins and pea-vines among the flowers on sunny open spaces. Large areas have already been stripped bare, or nearly so, compelling the poor hungry wool-bundles to scatter far and wide, keeping the shepherds and dogs at the top of their speed to hold them within bounds. Mr. Delaney has gone back to the plains, taking the Indian and Chinaman with him, leaving instruction to keep the flock here or hereabouts until his return, which he promised would not be long delayed. How fine the weather is! Nothing more celestial can I conceive! How gently the winds blow! Scarce can these tranquil air-currents be called winds. They seem the very breath of nature, whispering peace to every living thing. Down in the camp dell there is no swaying of tree-tops. Most of the time not a leaf moves. I don't remember having seen a single lily swinging on its stalk, though they are so tall the least breeze would rock them. What grand bells these lilies have! some of them big enough for children's bonnets. I have been sketching them, and would fain draw every leaf of their wide, shining whorls, and every curved and spotted petal. More beautiful, better kept gardens cannot be imagined. The species is Lilum pardalilum, five to six feet high, leaf whorls a foot wide, flowers about six inches wide, bright orange purple spotted in the throat, segments resolute, a majestic plant. End of section 2 And pitiful, all from eating the leaves of the blessed azalea, so at least say the shepherd and the don. Having had but little grass since they left the plains, they are starving, and so eat anything green they can get. Sheepmen call the azalea sheep poison, and wonder what the Creator was thinking about when He made it. So desperately does sheep business blind and degrade, though supposed to have a refining influence in the good old days we read of. The California sheep owner is in haste to Section 2 of My First Summer in the Sierra This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. My First Summer in the Sierra by John Muir Read by Adrian Pretzelis Section 2 June 7 The sheep were sick last night and many of them are still far from well, hardly able to leave camp, coughing, groaning, looking wretched, almost everything worth seeing. As for the shepherd, his case is worse still, especially in winter when he lives alone in a cabin. For although stimulated at times by hopes of one day owning a flock and getting rich like his boss, he at the same time is likely to be degraded by the life he leads and seldom reaches the dignity or advantage, or disadvantage, of ownership. The degradation in his case has for cause one not far to seek. 
He is solitary most of get rich, and often does, now that pasturage costs nothing, while the climate is so favourable that no winter food supply, shelter pens, or barns are required. Therefore large flocks may be kept at slight expense, and large profits realised, the money invested doubling, it is claimed, every other year. This quickly acquired wealth usually creates desire for more. Then, indeed, the wool is drawn close down over the poor fellow's eyes, dimming or shutting out all the year, and solitude to most people seems hard to bear. He seldom has much good mental work or recreation in the way of books. Coming into his dingy hovel cabin at night, stupidly weary, he finds nothing to balance and level his life with the universe. No, after his dull drag all day after the sheep, he must get his supper. He is likely to slight this task, and try to satisfy his hunger with whatever comes handy. Perhaps no bread is baked, 